Welcome to Marketing Monday Wins and Fails Edition. Let's get right into it. We're back. It's been like three weeks and we're going to kick off with a win on finding a great deal. It's hard with how overvalued everything, every asset has been in the past two years. It's been hard to find a great deal. Nobody can get a good house at a good price anymore. But thankfully, I've found one. And who can jump on this quickly? Hopefully one of you. An unoccupied house on stilts in North Carolina. A cool $381,000 according to Zillow. Let's get a quick footage of it. It's a house and a boat. That should be worth more. I love a good fixer of <laughs> You don't get more oceanfront than that. You get the ocean right at your door. Again, we're in a unique spot for housing prices where despite the fact that everything else is sort of popping, tech stocks, crypto, housing has maintained generally its elevated prices due to a couple reasons that we'll see how they hold. But at least we can think about one thing. We can say one thing and be happy. At least we're not Canada because Canada's housing prices are twice as bad and getting worse. At least you can make your money back by... <laughs> Getting in on this brand new trend. This is absolutely a win for my man, Mark Zuckerberg, who is never late to the party, okay? Because he announced today, NFTs are coming to Instagram. Yes, right on time. This is right when the NFT craze is about to hit its peak. And I think it's what everyone's been asking for over at Instagram. They're like, hey, TikTok is starting to eat our lunch. What do we need? What's going to get our users back and get them back on Instagram? NFTs, baby. And let's ignore the fail of this false data that says there is an NFT market route. Weekly sales down 64%. Every NFT collection taking a beating. Look at all this fake news, dude, that Mark Zuckerberg carefully ignored in order to get his engineers working on an NFT solution for Instagram. Really appreciate his perseverance right on time. King, speaking of bored apes, I wanna give a third win to the lost art of laying people off with dignity. When you're a manager or an executive, you have to make layoffs, it's tough. Today has been a brutal day at the office. I made the painful decision to let go of 87 beloved members of the Cameo Famio. <laughs> You cannot say cameo famio as you fire people while hodling your hexagonal bored ape avatar. Nobody who got fired by you wants to see this. But you know what? I thought about it more and it really is a win because his employees who are now down financially because they don't have a job can at least know that he shares in their pain and is also down financially. <laughs> after spending 300 grand plus on this NFT, which will not sell for anywhere near that amount. Uh, but speaking of uh, crypto, NFTs, they're all down. But if you did want to consider getting involved in investing in perhaps more safer stocks, or maybe you just wanna test your brain and invest small fractional parts of money just to see how things would do. Perhaps you might wanna check out Public, the sponsor for today's Marketing Monday. I literally use this app every day to check my stocks. It's extremely clean, it's easy to use. It's got a great interface. It has easy access information and it's uh, all included in the app. You can follow investors if you wanna see what they post. You can follow me on there. You can follow Cody Co or Scott Galloway or it does not have an unethical business model that requires them to sell information on your trades to hedge funds. I independently reviewed it myself before I accept this sponsorship. It literally is true. They literally have an actual ethical business model. But what I would say is a cool thing you can do because people like to think about what they'd invest in is you could do fractional shares. Like if you could, just, if you want to buy like 0.01% of an Amazon share for a dollar, you can do that and then see how it, what percent it goes up and down. So you can like almost do like a test bet and like test your theories over over six months to a year and just see like what would happen. Check it out. Thanks again to Public for sponsoring. Back to the wins and fails, but big win to Public. Let's go to a fail now. Not of course, one man who let the real Famio down. And that's Justin Lin, former director of Fast 10, who reportedly quit his directing job of Fast 10 because of a perfect man, Vin Diesel. He claimed that Diesel always shows up late to the set, doesn't know his lines, and he shows up out of shape. What about family, Justin Lin? And what's crazy is if you look more into this, he is giving up between 10 and $20 million just to not work with Vin Diesel. <laughs> do you know how bad that has to be? People do not like to work with Vin Diesel for some reason. And it's very odd. And so I found this video proving that Vin Diesel is absolutely a treat to work with. This is from Vin Diesel's Instagram story 
the day before Justin Lin quit. And it's like, how could you possibly see this coming? Because he seems so, so, um, having so much fun the whole time. What do you think, Justin? Week one. Just finish week one. Is it fair to say that this will be the best one? In my heart, yes. Oh! Wow, you can just tell that he was not a hostage at all. Obviously, Fast 10 must go on. It's the movie event of the millennium. And so, director Louis Leterrier is going to be replacing Justin Lin, who... You probably don't know by face or name, but he did create magician movie, Now You See Me, <laughs> which famously has quote unquote magicians performing actual magic. It might actually be good because that kind of cheesy over the top energy that Now You See Me has is kind of the perfect energy for Fast, Fast and the Furious. So I'm actually not opposed to it. You guys know that in the past decade, the big trend in the world of gaming has been towards live service games. Games that are constantly being updated live. You can play them forever and they keep adding new patches and skins. Apex Legends, live, Fortnite, live service games. The problem with those games is that there's too many players. You know, there's so many millions of people playing Fortnite that when they make an update or a new skin, it could be for anybody. Maybe I want skins that are tailored towards me. That's why I want to shout out the heroes over at Babylon's Fall, a game that had exactly one player. This game just launched and is already down to exactly one player on a live service game. It is the first live service game that I have seen where the staff working on it outnumber the player base <laughs> significantly. <laughs> that means this guy has skin artists, uh, game directors, programmers, uh, an entire team of people working to make his or her experience better. That's powerful. This is, of course, from Square Enix and Platinum Games. By the way, Square Enix. Square Enix is selling all of its Western assets, including Tomb Raider, Deus Ex, for like fire sale prices of $200 million. They have literally just said, fuck it, we are completely out. They did it to invest in crypto. Not a joke. I actually didn't hear that. Is that true? Square Enix sold Tomb Raider for magic crypto beans. <laughs> I did. Oh my God, this is a live wins and fail. Wait, I, I knew they had sold. I did not know Square Enix sells Tomb Raider to bet big on the blockchain. Yeah, and they did it right before the crash. <laughs> and they sold, dude, they sold Tomb Raider and Deus Ex for phenomenally cheap to get nfts that's so crazy i want to give a win here you know how like in in uh movies and, and film there will often be like a a faded prophecy that that someone will tell someone and then when they try to stop that prophecy from happening they create it well that is happening right now <laughs> with the video game starfield which is worried that the game will become the next cyberpunk so to avoid that they're announcing massive delays <laughs> Bro, I've seen this story before. I know what's happening. The only difference between this situation, Starfield, which was one of the most hyped games of this year, it's originally announced been delayed to next year, is that Cyberpunk's developer, Siege Project Red, had a good reputation going into it. <laughs> this is Bethesda, dude. Everyone already expects this game to have a buggy launch. Now it's gonna be a delayed, crunched, I'm sure, still buggy launch. And, and you know what, that's what I'm saying. How buggy? Does the game have to be if Bethesda delayed it because they think it's too buggy? <laughs> Bethesda has shipped so many buggy games. How fucking bad does this one have to be if they were like, we can't. <laughs> we actually can't. Let's give a uh, surprising first of the year fail to Xbox and a surprising first of the year dub to Sony, really. It feels like the entire narrative, at least in the West, for the first half of the year has been like Xbox firing on all cylinders. But with both Redfall and Starfield, a big exclusive they paid a lot of money for. They paid many, many billions to acquire Bethesda, like nine billion. And they don't have a game this year. It's making 2022 seem a little bit worse for the Xbox side. Combo that with a dub on the Sony side, which just announced their new PS Plus lineup to compete with um, Game Pass. And it's actually pretty good. They do have a decent um, Game Pass competitor that is improving rapidly because they see the future of the market. So like I said way back in my first video on this console war, as long as the competition remains fierce between Microsoft and Sony, the real winner will be the gamers. Both sides are getting better. Both sides are getting better games. 
PC gamers are winning most of all because they both have to put their games on PC to make a profit. This competition is awesome. The second one of them wins, it's going to be miserable. So we really have to hope that <laughs> the war continues as long as it can because we're getting a lot of great uh, improvements and innovation while the war is in full swing. You know what? I'm going to be honest with this one. Usually I, if I flip it, I don't know if you've learned my amazing joke where if it's a win, I'll say a fail. And if it's a fail, I'll say a win. I'm going to give an actual fail to what Elon Musk, the trend he has started. Because Jeff Bezos is now a Twitter shit poster. <laughs> He's coming out unhinged. And he launched today with some uh, all out attacks on the administration, uh, the Biden administration for their role in inflation and for suggesting that the wealthiest individuals on earth should pay more taxes. He really didn't like that part. It's pretty well established that raising taxes, especially progressive taxes that are increasing the wealthy, is actually one of the best tools to combat inflation. But I don't think that he is interested in that solution. I think he mostly wants to talk about people getting checks back during the pandemic in 2020, 2021. And he wants to call that the only cause of inflation. And there is no solution now. But he's still, he's still not yet in meme posting phase. We'll see if he gets there soon. I want to do a wins and fails like I've been talking about for a while on what's going on in the state of unions. The state of the union on unions. Uh, regularly, I give wins and fails updates on what's going on with unions. And for the past few months, I've been given win after win after win. Okay? There's been progress with the Amazon union. Progress with the Starbucks union. Progress with tons of unions. In fact, I'll give a win right now. The Target union is just launched. Employees in a store in Virginia just uh, ratified their union contract and they are now having a Target union. It's awesome. There is actual union progress, which is leading to, uh, you know, better worker protections, higher wages, um, less corporate control. They're not taking 99% of the profit. It's good. This is, this is all uh, actually an awesome thing and good for workers' rights. But we live in a pendulum-based <laughs> society here. And when things tilt towards the winds, eventually it comes back. And I do want to say, we are due for the empire striking back here. This past week has been a lot of news about all of the tactics that these big corporations are now using to fight back extra hard against the unions. They've now gotten spooked at the progress unions are making, and they are literally focusing insane efforts. For example, Starbucks just announced an illegal wage increase that would only apply to non-unionized workers. Basically saying, if you join the union, you won't get a raise. By the way, this is illegal, but they are doing it to scare more stores into not doing it. It's literally not allowed. It has been already like uh, shot down, so to so, quote, quote unquote, but they are publicizing it all over to try and scare stores into not joining the union. Again, as long as they can get their message out stronger than like the counter argument, they can scare enough employees away from ratifying union contracts at all these different stores. Starbucks union workers are actually starting to make real progress. On the other hand, a more scary enemy is Amazon. So I mentioned recently that Amazon had a uh, very big union win recently. It was the first one to make any progress against the monolith that is Amazon. And Amazon immediately fired back. Amazon went and fired every single senior manager who worked at that warehouse for losing the battle to the union. Sending a clear message to every single one of their other managers that if you don't do something to stop unions at your plant, you'll get fired, <laughs> which encourages them to do anything, illegal even. And their pressure has continued, their lobbying has continued, and the second labor vote at Staten Island was a loss for the Amazon labor union. So they couldn't even repeat their victory for their second warehouse. They only got one warehouse. We will see how it plays out. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm hoping and praying that the fight continues and then Amazon labor unions continue their uh, continued progress. But I just want you to know that like the empire is striking back here. I have two quick updates that will close out the wins and fails show. Number one, I'd like you all to say a farewell to the iPod. It may not have meant something to you, but it meant something to me. Okay, after 22 years, the final iPod has been created. It's been completely shut down. The last factory closed. There is no more iPods. This was really a breakthrough product. I'm not an Apple show. I don't even have an iPhone. But the iPod was a product that literally turned around a dying company. Apple was a dying small company, basically kept afloat by Microsoft, who was giving them money every year to use Office so that they could say they had competition. Literally, Apple was being kept afloat so that Microsoft could go to court and say they had competition. Uh, and now they're the biggest company in the world. 
three trillion dollars plus and it began with this turnaround from this ipod this product was a consumer um, electronics revolution the marketing was incredibly good 1000 songs in your pocket is one of the best taglines of all time it, it was basically genius and because i wanted to give a fun piece of honor for it and also shout out to the boomers in chat who had an original ipod i found this video of a girl getting an ipod for christmas in 2002. <laughs> So every CD you guys own between the two of you now can be, go on each one of those. It can? Yes. Good. And then you can listen to it anytime you want. Yeah. Anytime you want, any place you are. It's like a Walkman. It's, like a Walkman. it's, it's called the iPod. Okay, explain it a little further, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> they were not getting it. And that's within 20 years. It, it just always makes me think. I, I really like that video because it made me think like how much shit has changed in, you know, only two decades. You can imagine what shit's going to be like in 2040, dude. Shit's going to be fucking wild. The only reason that Apple got into the iPhone, again, Steve Jobs initially was like, we'll just keep making iPods. iPods are great. Don't distract from the core business of iPods. They got into the iPhone because they started looking around at the market and realizing that some of the other phone players were starting to add music functionality to phones. Music on phones starting to get a thing. They're like, wait a minute. If this keeps going, people aren't going to carry two devices. They're going to carry either a phone or an iPod. If this keeps going, they'll just put all their music on their phone and we're going to kill our iPod business, which is our biggest thing. We have to get ahead of that. And so actually their first solution was to partner with Motorola and they created what was called the iTunes phone, which is where Motorola would have the phone, but it would have built-in iTunes functionality. And if you ever want to watch it, it only has like 5,000 views, 10,000 views. It's one of the funniest keynote speeches Steve Jobs has ever done because you can tell that he fucking hates it. <laughs> Steve Jobs has never been less enthused in his entire life. He hates the product design. He tries to use it as a tech demo, it fails. He presses the wrong button, because there's too many, you know, it's complicated. Then he brings up the Motorola guy, who is an awful presenter. Anyway, the whole time, you could tell that Steve Jobs is very unhappy with his partnership. And it was after this keynote, they decided to start making their own phone, which led to the iPhone. Let me hit you with a final win and fail in a new segment. My brand new wins and fails update. It's not a win or a fail at all. It is what I call, what's up Beijing? Of course, introed by Premier Xi himself. What's up Beijing? <laughs> Thank you for the intro. Let's get into it. Uh, what's up Beijing where I'm gonna give you a little bit of a China update. A random person with the last name Ma was detained by Chinese police. And Alibaba lost $26 billion in value because everyone was scared that it was Jack Ma. <laughs> the CEO of Alibaba. It wasn't. $26 billion in value was lost instantly because the investors were so panicked that Jack Ma might have gotten arrested. It's actually so crazy how on edge every investor there is at any government action. It's the amount of control they have over the market is is insane and as an alibaba investor wow i was so happy that <laughs> a company i invest in lost 26 billion dollars in value in a day Woo! so that was one big update and i'm going to give one more and that is so uh if you guys don't know china's continuing its covid zero strategy which has draconian crazy insane levels of lockdowns across major cities the most uh, impacted being shanghai and uh they are now starting to pay a serious price for it their economy is slowing rapidly because literally factories can't run, trucks can't move, everything is so shut down that it's actually causing a severe crunch. So it's really, it's a, it's a no-win situation. But I wanted to give a quick update on China. I want to get into the main story of the wins and fails. This is, we're gonna, this is a new segment where I do a deeper dive, okay? Oh. 